Okay, here it is, the second crack at this exam. Um, I've done it before. I didn't read it properly. I made a couple of stupid mistakes just from not reading it properly. So, now I'm going to do it, hopefully, without any mistakes. So, the first question, the net force acting on a body, mass 10 kilos, is that? We know that force is mass times acceleration. So acceleration is force over mass. So our acceleration is going to be a half I plus six on five J. Now, if we know what our acceleration is, it says the initial velocity of the body is negative three J meters per second. Find the velocity of the body at any time T seconds. So we know that V of T is the integral of a half I plus six on five J DT, which is T on two I plus six T on five J plus some constant. We know when t equals zero, v is negative three j, therefore c is negative three j. So our velocity at any time is t on two i plus six t on five minus three J. The momentum of the body in kilogram meters per second when t equals 2. So we've got to find the velocity when t equals 2, which is i, because um, when I sub it in I get 2 over 2. Um, then I get 12 over 5 minus 15 over 5, which is minus 3 over 5j. We know that our momentum is mass times velocity. So if we multiply it by the mass, 10, 30 on 5 is 6, J. Okay. Always a good idea to bring attention to your answers. That way, if you've got any messed up working, but the answer's correct, they might just mark it right. Okay, this one here's a nice question that separates to anti-diff. 0 to 1, 2x over x squared plus 1. dx plus 0 to 1 of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. Now, the reason I wrote that is because when we anti-diff this, we get log e mod x squared plus 1 between 1 and 0 plus we know this is tan inverse of x over 1 which is just tan inverse of x between 1 and 0 if we sub 1 into here we get log e2 if we sub um, 0 into there we get 0 if we sub 1 into here, we get pi on 4. And if we sub 0 into there, tan inverse of 0 is just 0. It's a nice question for 3 marks. I mean, it benefits Ooh, you guys. Okay. A company produces a particular type of light globe called shiny. The mean mu is 200. The standard deviation is 10, n is 36, x bar, the sample mean is 195. Okay, it says write down the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. They're saying it's less than 200 weeks. So the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 200. 
And the alternate is that mu is less than 200 because it's a one-tailed test. So to determine the p-value, so we know the p-value is the probability that x bar is less than 195, given that mu is 200, which we know is the probability that z is less than 195 minus 200 over the standard deviation on the square root of the sample size. So we get the probability that z is less than negative 5 on top times 6, which is negative 30, over 10, which is negative 3. Now that's where this comes into play, because you know if that there is 0 0.9973, we know that that and that is 0 0.0027. So half of that is 0 0.0135. So here, um, to three decimal places, we get 0 0.001. Okay, what should the company be told if the test was carried out at the 1% significance level? As the p-value of 0 0.001 is less than 0 0.01, we, they should reject the null hypothesis. So, um, because it's so far away from the mean. Um, it's more than three standard deviations away from the mean. <clears throat> if you've got a sample of 36 um, and they had an average less than 195, it's not very likely to occur. So the mean really isn't 200 weeks. The company decided to produce a new type of light, the 95% confidence interval, for the mean lifetime sample of 25, the mean is 250 weeks and the standard deviation is 10 weeks. So we know 250 minus 1.96 if we want a 95% confidence interval multiplied by the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 2. 250 plus 1.96 times 2. 1.96 times 2 is 3.92. So we get 46.08246.08 and 253.92. Give it correct to two decimal places. So that is correct to two decimal places. Um, everything else is correct to decimal places. Okay, the shaded region is bound by the graph of y equals sine of x, the x-axis, and the first two non-negative x-intercepts of the curves. That is the interval from 0 to pi. The shaded region is rotated about the x-axis. So, the volume of the shaded region is pi, 0 to pi, our function squared, dx. Now, hopefully you guys remember that sine squared x is a half, 1 minus cos 2x. It's just a rearrangement of a double angle formula. So we get pi on 2, 0 to pi, 1 minus cos 2x dx, which is pi on 2 x if we anti-diff that, we get a half sine 2x between 0 and pi. We get pi on 2 times pi. Sine of 2x is 0, so we just get 
zero minus zero minus sine of zero is zero. So we end up with pi squared on two. Now it says to consider the function y sine of kx where k is a positive real constant. So we're basically going from f of x is sine x to f of kx is sine of kx. So that's a dilation one on k from the y-axis. Now, if you dilate one on k from the y-axis, it's going to bring it in and out, but it's going to change the area. Um, find the volume of the solid in terms of Vs. So we know um, it's going to be the volume is Vs on k. So it's whatever it previously was, divided by k. Okay, find the gradient of the curve with this equation. So, we know we want to diff it. If we diff that, we get e to the x, e to the 2y. So I diff that and left that alone. If I diff this, I get 2 e to the 2y dy dx. And then I've got to multiply that by e to the x. If we diff this, so I use the product rule there. If we diff this, we can't derive it with respect to x. So we know we've got to derive it with respect to y. We get 8y e to the 4y squared. But because we derived it with respect to y, we've got to add a dy dx on the end. So just for an example, if I had y squared and I wanted to find d dx of y squared, well, we know we can't find d dx of y squared, but we know d dx is equal to d dy times dy dx. So we can replace that with a y and then add on a dy dx because the dy's would cancel and we just end up with dx. So we just differentiate the function of y with respect to y and then add on a dy dx. So we get dy dx. Um, we get 2e to the x plus 2y plus 8y e to the 4y squared equals negative e to the x plus 2y when I bring them to the other side. So we get dy dx is negative e to the x plus 2y over 2e to the x plus 2y plus 8y e to the 4y squared dy dx when x equals 2, y equals 1. Um, on top, we get 2 plus 2, so negative e to the 4. On the bottom, we get 2 plus 2, 2e two e to the 4. Um, and then we get plus 8e to the 4, which is negative e to the 4 over 10 e to the 4, which is negative 1 over 10. So I forgot to put more boxes around these. The problem with getting used to this stuff is when you go to a normal piece of paper and you try to do this, it doesn't make it into a square for you. And when you're helping a student, you look like a dickhead because um, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. And then I realize I'm waiting for a straight line to appear when it's not going to. Oh, wow, we did more than I thought. Okay. 
Okay, consider the three vectors a, b, c. P is a real constant. Find the values which these three vectors are linearly independent. I should have put that in bold. Bit nasty, I reckon. Negative m plus 2n coefficient, coefficient, coefficient is 3. 6m plus minus 8n is equal to 2. Last one, negative 3m plus 5n is equal to mod of 1 minus p squared. If we multiply the top equation by 4, negative 4m plus 8n is equal to 12. 6m minus 8n is equal to 2. If we add them, we get 2m is equal to 14. So m is equal to 7. If we bring it back here, we get negative 7 plus 2n equals 3. Therefore, n is equal to 5. So we can say negative 3 times m, negative 21, plus 25 is equal to 1 minus p squared. We can say 1 minus p squared. Why do they give you so much bloody room for this stuff, but they don't give you anything towards the end? That's equal to 4. So you can say 1 minus p squared is equal to negative 4, and 1 minus p squared is equal to positive 4. This one here, we get p squared is equal to 5. So p is equal to plus or minus root 5. Um, and this one here, we get p squared is negative 3. Um, P is real, therefore no solution. Now it asks for the values of P for which is linearly independent. P is an element of all reals, because we not, don't want it to be dependent, we want it to be linearly independent, except for plus or minus root 5, because that's when it's linearly dependent. To be linearly independent. Okay. Hmm. The velocity of a particle satisfies the differential equation dx dt is x sine t, where x centimeters is displacement relative to the fixed origin at time t seconds. Initially, the displacement is 1. So the first thing I would do is flip it, dt dx is 1 on x sine t. So then we can say the integral of sine t dt is equal to the integral of 1 on x dx. Um, if we anti-diff sine, we get negative cos of t. And if we anti-diff this, we get log e mod x plus c when t is equal to 0, x is equal to 1. So negative 1 is equal to 0 plus c. c is negative 1. We know um, mod e mod x is equal to 1 minus cos of t. Mod x is equal to e to the 1 minus cos of t, we know that x, x of t, is plus or minus e to the 1 minus cos of t. However, x of 0 is equal to 1. Therefore, x of t is e to the 1 minus cos of t. Find the maximum displacement of the particle and the times at which this occurs. So we know 
cos of t, that can be anything from negative 1 to 1. If negative cos of t is equal to negative 1, hang on, if negative cos of t is equal to 1, cos of t will be equal to negative 1. So t will be an element of, when does cos equal negative 1? Think about a cos graph at pi. Um, and then each time after that, it's another 2 pi along. So plus 2 n pi, where n is a natural number, or could also be 0. Now, if that's the case, we get e to the 2. So the maximum displacement is e squared. And the times at which this occurs, so that makes sense, pi plus 2 n pi. Once again, didn't square off my answers. This one here. Um, this one is both of these. I wonder if most people gave, I mean, the dead giveaway there is the fact that it says times. Okay, this one here, we can complete the square. Z squared plus 2Z plus 1. Minus 1 plus 2 would give us plus 1. Z plus, mm, that's worth one mark, so you could have just given the answer. So usually I would say z plus 1 squared is negative 1. So z, when I bring that to the side, I get plus or minus i, and um, that'll be negative 1 plus or minus i. In this second case, we know z is a complex number, but z is x plus yi. So x and x is real and y is real. Now, I really think they should state that in the question, but so if we replace z with x plus yi squared plus 2 times x minus yi plus 2 is 0, we get x squared minus y squared plus 2xyi plus 2x minus 2yi plus 2 is 0. If we put our real components in the first bracket, x squared minus y squared plus 2x plus 2 plus our imaginary components, we've got 2y, actually let's just write 2xy, minus 2yi equals 0. So we can say, therefore, 2y x minus 1 is 0. So y is 0, x is 1. We can then say when x equals 1, we get 1 minus y squared plus 2 plus 2 is 0. So that bit there, set it equal to 0, because on the other side, the real component is 0. So we get y squared is equal to 5. So y is plus or minus root 5. We can then say when x, when y is equal to 0, we get x squared plus 2x plus 2 is 0. And we know from the previous question that only gives 
imaginary solutions. So we say no real solutions because that's only going to give imaginary. So we then say Z is equal to um, 1 plus or minus root 5i. So they are our possible solutions for that equation. Now there may be a fast way to do it, but I couldn't think of it. Okay, here we've got a vector, oh, a vector calculator, a vector question. Um, we know R of T is that function. S of t is the second function, their position vectors relative to the origin. Particle A is the first one, B is the second one. C is a positive constant. So the maximum value of t would be pi on 2. Oh, I couldn't actually equal pi on 2 either because of tan. kind of weird because you'd have an asymptote and this has to be a continuous domain so anyway all right let's have a look at it we know um we're ta talking about the cartesian path of a so we can say x is negative one plus four cos t therefore x squared sorry cos squared t is x minus 1 squared on 16. We know that y is 2 on root 3 sine of t. So sine squared t is 3y squared on 4. We know cos squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. Therefore, x minus 1 squared on 16 plus 3y squared on 4 is equal to 1. Now, it says to show the Cartesian equation of the path of the particle A. It's the last quadrant. Um, the path of the particle A in the first quadrant can be given by this. So we say 3y squared on 4 is equal to 16. I'm putting them all in the common factor. Minus x minus 1 squared on 16. 3y squared on 4 is equal to we're going to get 16 minus x squared. We get minus 2x, but when we times it by a minus, we get plus 2x. And then we get plus 1, but it becomes a minus 1 over 16. When we bring that to the other side, we get y squared is equal to... Um, we're going to get 4 over 16, which is 1 over 4. And then we're going to divide it by 3. So it's going to be over 12. And on top, we get negative x squared plus 2x plus 15. When we square root the right-hand side, plus or minus square root, negative x squared plus 2x, is it plus or minus? Minus 2x, so that's a minus because that is supposed to be an x plus 1, isn't it? It is, plus 1. Okay, so that becomes a minus 2x, so that is a 
minus 2x, which means that's a minus. And that's over 2 root 3. If we multiply that by root 3 over root 3, we say y is greater than 0 in the first quadrant. So we've got the d. Therefore, y is equal to um, root 3 root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 over the bottom we would get 6. So the particles will collide. So the easiest thing to do here is to let their j components be the same. So we let rj of t equal sj of t, which is 2 on root 3 sine of t is equal to tan of t. We know tan is sine over cos, so we get 2 over root 3 is 1 over cos. So cos of t is equal to root 3 on 2. So t is equal to pi on 6. Yeah. Okay, now if t is pi on 6, um, we want to find r i of pi on 6, which is negative 1 minus cos of pi on 6. Is that it? Minus 4 cos of pi on 6. And we know cos of pi on 6 is root 3 on 2. Is that positive or negative? Positive. So we get negative 1 plus 4 times root 3 on 2 is 2 root 3. So I'm just going to change it the other way and say 2 root 3 minus 1. And then we can say S i of pi on 6 is, where is it, 3 over cos of pi on 6, or you could say sec of pi on 6, 3 sec of pi on 6 minus 1. Now, if we know cos of pi on 6 is I'm wrong um, cos of pi on 6, we know is root 3 on 2. So sec of pi on 6 is 2 on root 3. So 3 times 2 on root 3 minus 1, which is 2 root 3 minus 1. Therefore, when t equals pi on 6, they will collide. Find the coordinates of the point of collision. So we know that <coughs> it's 2 root 3 minus 1. If we sub pi on 6 back into tan, tan of pi on 6 is 1 on root 3 or root 3 on 3. So that's where they would collide. Okay, so here that was a show that question, but that's our answer. Likewise here. Didn't do what I wanted it to do. This one here is pi on 6 and we know that both of those are the same and then the last one is the coordinates 
So we'll just give the X and Y value. Okay, now this thing does look super nasty. Um, we can say, if we look at just this, so we can diff them separately, we could say, um, U is equal to X plus one, therefore Y, what am I doing chain rule yet? Y is equal to eight sine inverse of U on two. We know um, U dash is one, Y dash is eight times one over the square root of four plus u squared. Okay, if we multiply them together, we get eight over the square root of four plus, is it plus or minus? Hmm. And that's a four, not a two, which means that's a 16. So 16, X plus, now I've got to work out whether it's a plus or a minus, I'm having a bloody mental blank. Um, it's a pretty sure it's a minus. So we get X minus one, I mean, we can look up here because it's got to be the same. It is, minus and it's x plus one squared okay and we know the bottom is when we expand that we know that's negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. so that's d dx of 8 sine inverse of x plus 1 on 4. now they don't give you any bloody room Okay, so with the second bit, u is x plus 1 on 2, v is negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 to the half, u dash is a half, v dash, we bring our half down to the front, multiply it by negative 2x minus 2, and then we get negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 to the negative a half. Now, this can be simplified to be negative x plus 1, because that will cancel with those, and we can take out a negative, over the square root of, I'll just, uh, over the square root of, um, negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. Now, we know we've got to use the product rule. So we can say d dx of x plus 1 on 2. I don't know where they expect you to do the freaking working out for this bloody thing. x plus 1 on 2 times root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 is, now we've got to cross them. So we get root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 over 2 minus x plus 1 times this. Um, so we get minus x plus 1 squared over 2 root negative x squared plus minus 2x plus 15. Now, if we put a root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 here, that becomes squared. So we end up with the same denominator 
2 root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. On top, we get negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 minus x squared minus 2x and minus 1. Actually, let's move this over here and see if we can fit it in. So we get negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 over 2 root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 minus x squared minus 2x minus 1. So on the numerator, we would get um, negative x squared, negative 2x squared. I'm going to get negative 4x. So minus 2x. And I'm going to get plus, um, let's just write it out properly, negative 2x squared, negative 4x plus 14 over 2 root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. So then we can say d dx of 8 sine inverse of x plus 1 on 4 plus x plus 1 square root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 on 2. We can say that this is 2 on the denominator, negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 over and a 16 on top. Now, we add these together and when we do, we get 16 minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 14 over 2 root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. Now we know they can be added together and give 30, and we can take out um, 2 as a common factor. So we get negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 over the square root of negative x squared minus 2x plus 15, which is negative the square root of negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. If you wanted to, you could say negative x squared minus 2x plus 15 to the half, and then say that's to the one. Now, two marks. There must be some fantastic fast way that I don't know about, or that I can't remember how to do, to get the answer for that to be worth two marks. It's crazy. Okay, now hence find the area bounded by the graph of that and that, the x-axis and the lines x equals one, and root, uh, two root three minus x, uh, minus one. So we can say our area is from one to two root three minus one of root 3 on 6, square root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. I was just going to work this out on my head because it's only worth two marks and look at all the space I've given us. Okay, we know when we anti-diff this, we get this. So we get 8 sine inverse of x plus 1 on 4 plus x plus 1 on 2 
root negative x squared minus 2x plus 15. Between 1 and 2 root 3 minus 1. Now we know if we sub 2 root 3 minus 1 into here, we get 2 root 3 plus 1 minus 1, which cancels. So we get 2 root 3 over 4, which is 8 times sine inverse of root 3 over 2. We know sine inverse of root 3 over 2 is pi on 3. So we get 8 pi on 3. If we sub 2 root 3 into here, we get plus 2 root 3 plus 1 minus 1, 2 root 3 over 2, which is just root 3. If I sub 2 root 3 minus 1 into negative x squared, we get this into this here, we get the square root. 2 root 3 squared is 4 times 3, which is 12, minus 4 root 3, and then plus 1, minus 2 times x, so minus 4 root 3, um, is that like negative x squared or is it plus x? No, negative 2x. Okay, so minus 4 root 3 um, plus 2. And then, what have I done wrong? Minus 2. So negative x squared. Oh, oh shit. So we know. Because it's negative x squared, it's negative. That squared is 12 minus 4 root 3, and then plus 1 minus 2 times 2 root 3 minus 1 plus 15. We know negative 13 plus 2 is negative 11, plus 15 is 4. We've got positive 4 root 3 and minus 4 root 3, so it's just root 4, which is 2. So we get plus 2 root 3. Minus, when I sub 1 in, I get 8 sine inverse of a half, and we know sine inverse of a half is pi on 6. So we get 8 pi on 6, which is 4 pi on 3. And then if I sub 1 into that, I get plus 2 over 2, which is 1. If I put 1 into there, I get negative 1, negative 3. I get plus root 12, which is 2 root 3. And don't forget, out the front, we've got our root 3 on 6. They cancel. So we get 4 pi on 3 times root 3, root 3 on 6, which is 4 pi root 3 on 18, which is 2 root 3 pi over 9. So there's some shitty algebra in there, and look, those last four marks are really, like everything else is super doable. You just gotta make sure you read the question and think about it. So that's stuffing up last time, and I didn't even consider um, Z is X plus YI, where X is real and Y is real. Um, pretty sure, oh, I forgot, no, that's got that equals one. Pretty sure everything is correct in this. Um, hopefully the guys in 2022 after, I don't know how they're going to mark this because it's worth two marks. Like what the hell? Hmm. 
they must know something I don't. Um, good luck on your exam two on Monday. Bye.